Hi, and welcome to GPD's first edition of Glass Artists of the Month. Our Glass Artist of the Month for October 2009 is Rick Sateva from Sateva Art Glass. If you haven't checked out Rick's site, you really ought to. It's a great site with some really cool glass. Uh, you can find a link to it on our, on our website. We're lucky enough to have Rick on the line here for a quick interview. Uh, Rick, you've been doing this for about 40 years now, is that correct? Yeah, exactly. I started, gosh, in high school. Um, I was fortunate my high school had a program, and I was introduced to glass blowing then, and that was in uh, 1970, 1969, 1970. So, so in your high school, they had a program for glass blowing. What kind of glass did you guys blow? You know, we were we used just colors. Uh, it was color, which is reused glass uh, from uh, different manufacturers. I think at the time. Well, there was a plant actually in San Jose that, that made fiberglass marbles, uh, Owens Corning. They used to get scrap from them. Then they went to Blanco, which was a, a, a mold-blowing company in West Virginia, and used their cullet. And what so it, kind was, of, it was a primitive setup, but uh, it was great for us. And the teacher didn't know anything about glass blowing, so it was, you know, we were pretty much had to run of the place. So you got to kind of teach yourself. What were some of the first things you made? You know, the first time just learning to just even get a bubble started was a big deal. Because we didn't have a glory hole. No, they just had a melting furnace. It was a day, what you call a day tank. And uh, you would gather and work out of the same furnace. And the more you're heating, the cooler it would get because uh, you'd have the door open. And they're not really designed to have a door open all the time. So they would get cold and the glass would get so stiff you can hardly gather. Um, yeah, it was... It was pretty funky. I have a couple of those early pieces still in my old archival collection. Oh, is that right? Yeah, they got all got stones and bubbles and all sorts of cording, all sorts of bad stuff going on. But it was all part of the experience. So were y'all starting to mess with colors and adding little stripes and whatnot, or y'all keep? Not keep... really. We was, you know, we primarily were just doing just single color, which is we would of course add color to the tank, like cobalt for blue and uh, copper for some reds and stuff. But uh, primarily it was just uh, we got into, it was later when I was into college that I got into some of the color bars and colors that were uh, coming out of Europe, which was, Kugler was the first one to bring color over here to the States. But right. even then, there was very little color available for anybody. You had to make it. Even when I first started my shop here, the first thing I did was, I, you know, I, I made all my colors. I still do to this day. I do, I do buy it use some of the colors available from the various manufacturers, but primarily uh, when I come up with new designs and new work, it's part of it is coming up with the formula for the color. Do you guys use mostly uh, the basics? I mean, you, the, the copper and, you know, cobalt and gold and all those colors, and you mix those, or, or there is it more complex than that? Yes and no. It's, I have one furnace that is just for colors, and there's five crucibles in there. And so I juggle it around where I can melt uh, five different colors. In order to do that, I, I make it, I'll take the frit, the drippings from our clear furnace, frit that down, and then with that I'll make, uh, I'll add whatever I'm adding for whatever color. Like for, for our copper red, of course, there's copper, tin oxide, and carborundum for a reducing agent. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll put the reducing agent in the formula since we can't change the atmosphere because it will It'll help one glass; it'll affect another. Where did you guys get the idea? Where did you get the idea to to attack the jellyfish? It seems like that would have been one of the harder things, you know, one of the most challenging things to try to do. Oh, totally, and it was. I first got the idea for, after visiting the Monterey Bay Aquarium in the mid '80s, and I got to know some of the people there, and I was thinking that I was a perfect subject matter for glass because it's translucent. You can see to it, which is the best part of glass is the translucency of it and so forth. So uh, I went to them and said, look, I'm, I'm working on this jellyfish thing. If I put it together, will you guys you know, help me market it? And they said, oh, we'd love to. So then they went ahead and put this show together that's called Jellyfish Show. And I told them I'd have it ready for the show, and I was nowhere near ready. It took me five years to figure out all the formulas and, and how to do it the way we do it. I kept wow. working on it, and I was still doing my vessels, uh, which we still do to this day. I was doing other work. I was busy with other things, so I would work on it for a while and sit back until I'd come up with another idea and play around with it. And, and of course, the biggest part was figuring out the dome, the, the, the formula for, for the jellyfish, and that's what really makes it is, is the translucency of the color. You can see right through it, and you see right to the 
inside of the jellyfish. The, the jellyfish are based, are those based on actual breeds, the different colors of jellyfish, or was that sort of your artistic yeah, take on it? Yeah, the first one, which was the primary, the most successful, is the moon jellyfish, which is that color. Uh, the Pacific Coast is the, the one that's sort of an orange, that's called a stinging kettle. Uh, then there's uh, Pelagius, it's a purple stripe, but most of me, yeah, I got ideas of looking at real jellyfish. Yeah, I'll tell you, I sent a, a, a text picture, I was goofing around and, and you know, went to your site on my phone and I took that picture and I sent it around to a few friends of mine and, and uh, one of my friends is big into PETA and she said, sent back that it was horrible that they put the jellyfish in that small of a container. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, just testament to how, how real they really do look. I had one years ago, I had a story from a client who had bought a jellyfish and had gone down to the Cayman Islands with his fiance and presented it as a present underwater. What do you think is the best compliment you've gotten on any piece of work you've done? You know, vases, jellyfish, whatever. What's the, what's the biggest compliment in your mind that comes to mind? Oh, gosh. I, you know, probably being put into the permanent collection of the Corning Museum. You know, that was a really good compliment. That was for the jellyfish. They, it was over one of the, the – they had a show, uh, the top 100 paperweight sculpture makers in the world, and I was one of three guys who were in the – fairly new work that made it. Most of them are real old, turn of the century. So that was that was pretty cool. That was just about a year ago, two years ago, I believe. Um, well, I think I've taken up enough of your time, Rick. I wanted to keep this short. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time out of your day to do this, and uh, and congratulations on uh, being our Glass Artist of the Month. Well, thank you, and uh, I appreciate you uh, putting us on the air. Yeah, you bet.